Partner Flight 394 was a chartered flight which crashed on 8 September 1989 off the coast of Denmark 18 km north of Hertzschels. All 50 passengers and five crew members on board the aircraft died, and it was the biggest aeroplane accident in Denmark. It was caused by use of counterfeit aircraft parts in repairs and maintenance. Topic. Aircraft The aircraft, registered Lane PAA, was a 36-year-old Convair CV-580 operated by the charter airline Partner. The plane had switched owners several times and had various modifications. The aircraft had multiple previous registrations, N73128, ECFDP, PKGDS, HR Sachs, JA101C, N770PR and CGKFT and had been rebuilt after a landing accident in 1978. The most significant modification was a change from piston engines to turboprop engines in 1960, this added more horsepower to the aircraft. A Canadian company that specialized in servicing conveyors was the owner of the aircraft before Partner acquired it. Lane PAA was one of the most recently acquired aircraft in the Partner fleet. At the time of the crash, there were two other Convair 580 in the Partner fleet. Topic. Background At the time of the accident Partner was in financial difficulty. The airline's debts were such that, on the day of the accident flight, Norwegian aviation authorities had notified Norwegian airports to not allow Partner aircraft to depart since Partner had not paid several charges and fees. Topic. Flight The Convair 580 aircraft was en route from Oslo Airport, Fornebu, Norway to Hamburg Airport, West Germany. The passengers were employees of the shipping company Wilhelmsen Lines who were flying to Hamburg for the launching ceremony of a new ship. Half of the employees of the company's head office were on board. Leif Tarier Ladisal, an executive of Wilhelmsen, said that the atmosphere in the company was very, very good. Prior to the accident flight, he said that some of the employees, maybe, had been to prior naming ceremonies, which he described as quite exciting. A regular employee on the flight, one of the top performing employees in the company, had been asked to give the speech during the launching ceremony. Ladisal said that it was not often that a normal person in the company was chosen to read the speech at the naming ceremony. The flight crew consisted of Captain Knut Tveten and First Officer Finn Petter Berg, both 59. Tveten and Berg were close friends who had flown together for years. Both pilots were very experienced, with close to 17,000 successful flight hours each. Berg was also the company's flight operations manager. Before the flight, the crew found that one of the two main power generators was defective and had been so since 6 September. Also the mechanic who had inspected the aircraft was unable to repair it. In the Norwegian jurisdiction an aircraft is only allowed to take off if it has two operable sources of power. Also the aircraft's minimum equipment list required two operating generators. The first officer decided that he would run the auxiliary power unit APU, throughout the flight so that the flight would have two sources of power and therefore be allowed to leave. The airport refused to let the flight go until the catering bill was paid. Before the aircraft took off, the first officer left the cockpit to pay the catering company. As a result of this, the plane was delayed by almost an hour, finally departing at 3.59 p.m. as the Partner aircraft passed over the water at its planned cruising attitude of 22,000 feet, a Norwegian F-16 Fighting Falcon fighter jet passed by it. The fighter pilot was startled by the sudden appearance of the aircraft and contacted Oslo Air Traffic Control. 
He believed that the radar data to be false and that the aircraft was closer to his jet than his onboard computer had indicated. As the aircraft neared the Danish coastline, 22,000 feet 6 meters over the North Sea, Copenhagen Air Traffic Control saw that Flight 394 was off course and falling quickly, appearing to crash into the sea, roughly 20 kilometers north of the Danish coast. Topic. Investigation Accident Investigation Board Norway AIBN, investigated the disaster and were able to recover 50 of the 55 bodies before sending them through autopsies in Denmark. Investigators used side-scan sonar to plot positions of wreckage. The pieces had settled over an area 2 kilometers 1.2 miles wide, leading the investigators to believe that the aircraft disintegrated in the air. Luckily, 90% of the aircraft could be reconstructed. In an accident flight, the cockpit voice recorder CVR, can usually record its final minutes. In the Partner crash, however, it had recorded the start of the flight and stopped shortly before the aircraft took off. From the maintenance records investigators found that, 10 years prior to the accident flight, the cockpit voice recorder's power supply had been rewired to connect to the aircraft's generator instead of the aircraft's battery if full power was applied for takeoff. As the generator was inoperative on this flight, power to the CVR shut off as the aircraft took off. Some initial speculation stated that explosives brought down Flight 394. Indeed, in December 1988, a bomb had brought down Pan Am Flight 103. In addition, Norwegian Prime Minister Gro Harlem Brundtland had used that particular partner aircraft on her campaign trips. The Norwegian press believed that the crash was an assassination attempt. Witnesses of the crash said that they heard a loud noise as they saw the aircraft fall. The fact that the aircraft had disintegrated in the air gave credibility to the bomb theory. The speculation in the press later included a scenario where the plane had been shot down, possibly by the NATO war exercise, Operation Sharp Spear, which took place on the day of the accident flight near the flight path, as investigators had found small traces of high explosives on parts recovered from the seabed. However, investigators found that the residue was not from a bomb or a warhead, as there was not enough of it present. Finn Heimdall, an AIBN investigator, said in an interview that the residue appeared to be more like a contamination than any other possibility. The sea had old munitions as many battles had been fought off the coast of Denmark. Investigators concluded that the aircraft pieces acquired residue from the bottom of the sea or that the traces of explosives were accumulated from contamination before the accident or due to storage. Metallurgist Terry Heeslip of the Canadian company Accident Investigation and Research Inc. examined the aircraft skin from the tail and found signs of overheating, specifically that the skin had been repeatedly flexed, through a phenomenon known as flutter. This caused investigators to further scrutinize the tail of the aircraft. Furthermore, the investigation team found that the auxiliary power unit, APU, which was in the tail, generated heat which melted certain plastic parts, indicating that the APU was operating during the flight even though it normally would not be. The mechanic who had inspected the aircraft on the day of the accident flight told the investigators that one of the aircraft's two main generators had failed and that he was not able to repair the faulty generator. The investigators discovered that the pilots had noted in the flight log that they operated the APU during the flight, since two power sources are required for flight. They also discovered that the front APU mount was broken, which allowed it to vibrate excessively. The two shroud doors on the aircraft tail were not present in the recovery. They were constructed with an aluminium honeycomb liner, and aluminium's reflective properties allowed the doors to appear on radar when floating free. This led the AIBN to conclude that the unidentified objects tracked at a high altitude by Swedish radar for 38 minutes were likely the shroud doors, which had separated from the aircraft tail. From this, the AIBN found that the tail failed at 22,000 feet. If the rudder moved in a violent manner, the weights behind the doors would also move violently and hit the shroud doors. 
Therefore, the rudder had made a violent movement as the accident unfolded. Partner suggested said that the F-16 fighter jet had been flying at a faster velocity and closer to the conveyor than reported in the media. Therefore, the jet, which would have broken the supersonic barrier at that point, would have created a supersonic pressure wave that would have caused the conveyor to disintegrate in midair. The National Aeronautical Research Institute, a Swedish aviation technology research facility, said that there was a 60% chance of this being the cause. The Norwegian F-16 pilot testified that his aircraft was more than 1,000 feet 300 meters above the conveyor. The investigators concluded that the F-16 would have had to have been within a few meters of the conveyor to have affected the passenger aircraft and had no evidence that the two aircraft were that close together, and the AIBN investigation found no connection to the accident. After the final report was issued, there was speculation that the AIBN had doubted the radar information that it received, leading the Thorison brothers to file a lawsuit, but a ruling in the Norwegian Lagmansrätt Intermediate Court dismissed this in 2004. The Flight Data Recorder FDR was an antiquated analog model which used metal foil strips scratched by moving pins. Here, it did not record vertical acceleration readings and misrecorded heading indications. One needle recorded some lines twice, initially confusing the investigators, leading the team to send the FDR to the American company which manufactured it. The manufacturer asked an ex-employee, the highest expert regarding the company's flight data recorders, to temporarily leave retirement to examine the recorder. The expert concluded that the needle supposed to have been recording the altitude had been shaking so much that it left other stray marks on the foil. This particular FDR was able to record for hundreds of hours. Further investigations found that the needle had been shaking abnormally for months. This told investigators that another component, not just the APU with the broken mount, had also been vibrating. The investigators charted the vibrations and found that two months before the crash, the vibration stopped for two weeks, since during that period the aircraft received a major overhaul in Canada by the airline's previous owner. Afterward, the vibrations increased up to the accident flight. During the Canadian company's test flights of the aircraft and its first several passenger flights for Partner, the FDR recorded almost no abnormal vibrations. A review of the maintenance records of the aircraft revealed that during the overhaul, the mechanic discovered wear on one of the four bolts and sleeves that held the vertical fin and fuselage together and replaced them. The vibration stopped after the parts were replaced, but gradually worsened afterwards. After investigators recovered all four bolts, sleeves, and pins, they found that the parts that were not replaced were counterfeit and were incorrectly heat-treated during manufacture. Those bolts each could bear only about 60% of their intended braking strength, making them less than practical to use on the aircraft. The fake bolts and sleeves wore down excessively, causing the tail to vibrate for 16 completed flights and the accident flight. The investigators concluded that eventually, the APU and tail vibrations reached the same frequency and went into resonance, where the force of multiple same frequency vibrations add to that of one another and create one large vibration. This seems to indicate that the replacement of that one bolt may have actually worsened the vibration by changing the vertical stabilizer's natural frequency and possibly bringing it closer to that of the APU. Thus, the tail's vibration increased in amplitude until it failed and broke off. Topic. Aftermath As a result of the accident, safeguarding against counterfeit aircraft parts skyrocketed. Peter Friedman, an expert on spare aircraft parts, stated in an episode of the television program Mayday Air Crash Investigation, Air Emergency, that the Partner accident was the seminal event that required people around the world to recognize the proliferation of counterfeit aircraft parts in parts inventories. The spare aircraft parts industry had little regulation in many places in the world at the time of the Partner accident. 
The United States Department of Transportation USDOT, which oversees the Federal Aviation Administration FAA, decided to examine the scope of the spare parts in the United States. After auditing the FAA's inventory, the USDOT found that 39% of its parts were counterfeit. Those parts were traced back to some parts brokers that were prominent in making spare parts, however, up to 95% of the parts in those brokers' inventories were counterfeit. Mary Schiavo, the former Inspector General of the USDOT, said that American parts brokers had no regulation whatsoever. Schiavo stated that an individual with a telephone and a fax machine could become a parts broker and could get their parts from a variety of sources, including junkyards, scrap facilities, older aircraft, aircraft involved in accidents, and illegal parts manufacturers. Counterfeit parts were often less expensive than authentic parts, which meant that airlines that were bottom line driven in poor financial shape wanted to cut costs, driving them to acquire fakes. The FAA investigated false parts and captured illegal dealers in sting operations. They discovered a black market for counterfeiting aircraft parts where thousands of worn and inferior parts were made to look like newly manufactured versions. Throughout the aviation industry, aircraft parts are required to have documentation with signatures, which indicate that the parts are indeed authentic. However, the FAA found that approval tags were being counterfeited to make the parts appear authentic and that criminals were forging the signatures of authorized, trained, and certified inspectors. Friedman even claimed that the tags had more monetary value than the parts themselves. Americans initially believed that the proliferation of false parts mainly affected only smaller airlines, indeed, smaller airlines and repair stations were usually the businesses that were the most likely to be affected by fake parts. However, the FAA later found counterfeit parts in larger operations, including the discovery of counterfeit parts in aircraft of large, well-known airlines, even Air Force One, the aircraft used by the President of the United States, at one time contained fakes. As a result, illegal dealers and counterfeiters faced arrests, trials, and convictions. Schiavo stated that the among the most important actions taken by the United States government regarding the proliferation of counterfeit parts was the convictions of counterfeiters and illegal dealers. The FAA created a more rigorous documenting system to prevent the proliferation of fake aircraft parts and were eventually given the authority to press criminal charges on airlines who knowingly accept unapproved parts. In the 2000s, Schiavo said that aircraft parts are not counterfeited as often anymore because regulation of the spare parts industry has become much more strict than in the 1980s and the 1990s. Topic. Dramatization The crash was featured in Season 7 of the internationally distributed Canadian-made documentary series, Mayday, in the episode entitled, Blown Apart. <laughs> <laughs> Maps